hello everybody. Yeah. Oh, got my man over there. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Nathan Wakefield, aka Nathan McScary. Uh, you may have seen me perform on Friday in the Innovators Showcase. I am indeed an entertainer from Southeast Michigan. I'm also a uh, sideshow historian and author. Yeah. So today uh, it's Talking Geek. I'm gonna be talking about kind of the process that went into uh, writing my book, The Rise and Fall of the Sideshow Geek. I'm also gonna be going over kind of a general overview of the history of the Geek Act, uh, such as it was. And then I'm gonna do a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions about the book or about geeks in general, I'm happy to take that at the end of the lecture. Now, the first question I get uh, with the book which is, well, first of all, a little bit about the book. It is 32 pages of works cited sources, completely original interviews, seven appendices with two original translations. It took me five years to write, and it also has a foreword by somebody you might have heard of, J James Taylor. Does anybody here know that name? Yeah. That man there was a great help, so thank you again, James. You were phenomenal in making this be the best work it could be. But one of the first questions I always get with this particular project is, Nathan, why the hell would you write a book about the Sideshow Geek? <laughs> well, that's a good question. And I like to tell people that basically what it came down to was it started out as a late night rage writing session. And by that, I mean, I've been reading books about circus and sideshow for many, many years. And there are so many phenomenal works out there on, on the history of our craft. You know, they talk a lot about like the working acts, you know, the sword swallowers, the fire manipulators, the natural borns with the conjoined twins, little people, the history of Barnum and all this. But the one commonality I was finding in all these books and works was that they would talk briefly about Oh, and there were geeks that did this. Anyways, back to the rest of the stuff, and I was like, hold up. These people did what now? And I was just so taken aback that this geek act was a thing, but I was really dismayed to see the lack of historical information. It's like all these books wanted to acknowledge the geek, but didn't really want to talk about it. And I had so many questions. I thought, were there famous geeks? How did an act like this start? How did geek shows, how were they ran? I just I had all these questions. So I sat down one night and said, you know what? If I were to write a geek book, I'd write this, and I'd address these questions, and I'd answer this and this. And I just had a laundry list of questions. And then over the next few years, this as a, a kind of a personal project, I started filling in the gaps as I would track down information from archives and talking to people and sources. And as I fleshed it out over time, I was like, you know what? If I reorder this in a certain way, I think I can actually probably put this together in some sort of you know, cohesive nonfiction work. And so that was kind of the genesis of this project and, well, my motivation for writing it. Now, before I get any further with this, I actually have a question for you. What is a geek? Someone raise their hand. Back there, what's a geek? He eats weird things. He eats weird things. Okay, that's okay. Anyone else want to take a stab? Yeah. <laughs> Spoilers! Often um, portrayed as a, a wild man or like a feral creature who may or may not actually like be a live animal. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so that's one of the challenges I found early on. You have eats weird things or may or may not eat a live animal. So when I was, I dedicate the entire first chapter of my book to what is a geek because the interesting thing is. We have this idea of what a geek is, but depending on who you talk to, it's gonna be completely different. Like for example, eats weird things. Okay, could it be a stale lasagna? Would that be a geek? You know, and you said, you know, as a, as a wild person, do they have to be wild? You know, and I had people say, you know, they bite the heads off of chickens. Okay, can it be other animals? Do you actually have to kill the chicken? You know, can you pretend to do it? Where, where is the line drawn between what is a geek act and what is not? So what I did is I t went through and I got consulted numerous academic sources, numerous old showbiz articles, and then spoke to what I would consider to be a number of still living uh, thought leaders in the sideshow industry and posed that same question. And then I kind of put all that information together and looked for correlative uh, qualities that they all kind of paired up in its terms of what 
they felt a geek was. Now, obviously, everybody's definitions vary a little bit, but I basically came to the conclusion that there are four generally accepted criteria about what needs to be in place for something to constitute a geek act. Uh, the first one is that it needs to be a part of some sort of organized performance. Now, this naturally wasn't high art, so you probably wouldn't see a geek act at most theater stages, but you know, they're often pit shows out in the carnival lot, but uh, it did need to be some sort of an organized performance, usually a smaller, uh, smaller affair. Two, uh, the intention of the show is to elicit feelings of shock and disgust. You know, this wasn't burlesque. They weren't trying to titillate people, nor were they trying to show people and impress them with displays of technical skill. It was very much a gross-out act. But if you think about it, gross-out acts are very popular. I mean, we can all remember as a kid, you know, seeing somebody eat glue at, at, at recess or eat something gross on the playground. Oh, did they do that? Let me go see. You know what I mean? So there's always this fascinate, this primal fascination we have with seeing people do strange and gross things. Even if we don't like it, we can't help but look. And so that's kind of one of the, uh, the intention there is to do something shocking and disgusting. Uh, the third quality generally agreed upon is there needs to be an incorporation of some form of live vertebrate animals in the show. Um, typically these were snakes, uh, often also chickens, various fowl, even some mammals uh, like mice and whatnot, but an animal that had a, a vertebrate. Um, and then lastly, there is some form of oral implication or execution, wherein the animal is either put in the, the person's mouth or, you know, sometimes their head was bitten off or chewed on, but some sort of implication. It doesn't necessarily have to be killing or biting the animal, but even just pretending, sometimes that was enough. So those are the four generally agreed upon qualities as it relates to uh, what a sideshow geek act would entail. Interestingly, as we look at the sideshow geek act under a microscope in terms of how they were run, there's actually sort of two classification system as it relates to the types of geeks that there were historically. There were the ordinary geeks and then the gloaming geeks. Again, there's a little bit of variance here in terms of you know, what people say qualifies as which, but typically ordinary geeks were usually short-term geeks, oftentimes just local people that either wanted to just play a theatric part in a production. Sometimes they were indeed alcoholics or drug addicts, but oftentimes they would just play the part of a wild person for a few stops, pretend to put the animal in their mouth, or sometimes just exist among them and just act crazy. And occasionally they might beat the, eat the animal, but this was not common. They would just kind of exist among them as part of the geek act. Now, the gloaming geeks were more hardcore these were the geeks, first of all, gloam just means to grab or snatch something. So they would physically grab the animals and just bite the heads off, chew on them and so forth. That was kind of their shtick. They tended to be more long-term and a more hardcore of the bunch. They were the ones that would actually physically rip apart and or eat the animal. So that is ordinary versus gloaming geeks. Now, if we look at the operation of a geek show, a very common thing that was done was there would have the outside, you know, outside of the uh, canvas, and there'd be a, a banner there, right? Often of depicting a crazy, wild person, and the outside talker would hype it up, you know. Come and see the wild, feral person, or we're about to, ready to feed the geek. Get a ticket. And people would get a ticket, and they'd come inside, and there would be a pit of snakes or, you know, chickens, usually made of canvas or wood, usually a, a, above ground. Sometimes, sometimes there'd be an elevated walkway, but that wasn't as common and people would see the geek and he'd just be there, you know, acting strangely. And then at one point, if it was a snake show, which was common with the early geek acts, the geek would be among all these writhing snakes and he would reach down into the snake pit and he would grab a snake and he would look the audience in the eye. Then we'd throw a snake at them! <laughs> <laughs> and the thing was, this was actually a, a common fake out. The snake was actually either a piece of rope or a piece of tubing. Uh, that's something they did to kind of uh, do a crowd control. Another common thing that they would do is they would do what was called a roust, where the geek would be among the, among the, the pit, and at some point, he would get upright and leap towards the audience, and people would run out screaming. Now, this was done as kind of crowd control, and it was kind of a two, sort of two purposes, uh, both with the geek and uh, the rope and tubing, as well as with the, uh, the rousting technique, because what would happen is all these people would run out 
of the attraction screaming for their lives. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm walking around at a county fair and I see an attraction with people running in horror out of there, I'm sure as hell going to buy a ticket to see what's going on. So this served as a way to both move people out of the attraction as well as attract new people into the attraction. This was a, a common technique used to have a, a, an ending to the show as well as get people in and move people out so that they could continue on with the, uh, the geek show. When we look at geeking specifically, geek technique if you will, there are different ways to do it, but uh, if we're talking about what most people think of with a geek, that would be a chicken. I will demonstrate how that works. <laughs> we have a chicken. <laughs> the common technique uh, that was used with, mo with most gloaming geeks would be you take the head and you put it against the premolars in the side of the mouth. You bite down hard, but you don't just chew on it. You actually pull away with the neck while pulling away with the hand. So it's a bite and pull motion, which would look like this. So we've got the head, huh? Huh? <laughs> and then, of course, you would spray the audience. Or bah. So that was the idea behind the gl gloaming geek. You would get the head off. Sometimes they would eat it. But uh, that was the general idea between the gloaming geek. Now, <laughs> shameless plug, uh, as I was writing this book, I had some leftover art assets. And what I did was I put together a list of all the different techniques people use to actually commit the geek act. And so as kind of a, a gag, we actually released a, a companion pitch book, which I have right here, How to Geek. So if you want to endeavor yourself to start your geeking journey, this has information for you, $5 after the show, if you're interested. Okay, so one kind of unfortunate thing I encountered with this book off the bat was that I was a few decades late with my primary research. And by that, I mean that there are so many phenomenal show people out there right now that have a wealth of knowledge on the Sideshow Geek, but nearly all of them that both performed as geeks and ran geek shows, the showmen that operated the physical geek shows, had since passed on. So that's unfortunate, but you know, geeks are realistically a thing in the past, but I was able to interview some really intriguing people, um, one of which was actually a, a PhD therapist whose father used to run medicine shows and geek shows back in the 50s. And this kid who grew up to be the, the therapist, when he was a child, he would be in bed and his father, rather than reading him bedtime stories, he would tell him these fantastical stories about working on the midway, selling medicine bottles, and how he had this crazy geek show and all these wild things he would do with the sideshow geek. And it really resonated with this man. And I was able to talk to him. He gave me some phenomenal um, information about his father's show, as well as some, Im some images from a private scrapbook. So it was really cool to get to talk to people like that that had it in the family. Um, I was able to interview what I, would, what I would consider to be three actual still living people that performed as geeks at some point in their life. The thing that struck me with these three individuals is they all did the geek act in terms of the criteria that I mentioned previously, but they all did it for slightly different reasons, which was interesting to me. For example, the first gentleman I interviewed, he's a lifelong carny. And when he, in his younger days, when they were had, low on money at the carnival lot at a show, they would put up a makeshift pit above ground, get a ticket box, and on the last day, they would do a geek act just to get a little extra money before they went to the next town. And his perspective was, you know, back in my day on the carnival lot, we would do anything for money. If we had to do something weird or gross, that's what we did. It was part of the vocation and part of the times. So that was his perspective. So he would dress up all crazy and he would go inside a pit and he would cut up piglets and rip the guts out with his teeth. That's what he did because that was what he did for that particular job. Another person I interviewed, completely different, but similar backstory. And by that, I mean that this person is a Las Vegas burlesque showgirl. But in her younger years, her family owned a traveling sideshow. And so she would go with them when she was a little girl. 
Now, they had a geek in this show, but one time, midway through the season, the geek allegedly perished. So what did the parents do? They looked at their 12-year-old daughter, they put a potato sack on her, ruffled up her hair, and threw in a pit of snakes and said, here, you're now a wild girl. Scare people as we charge tickets for them to see you. I'm sure these days, Child Protective Services would not look fondly upon that. <laughs> but different times, and that was her family's business. So they did what they felt they had to do to run a continued lucrative attraction. So before she was even old enough to drive, she worked as a geek for several years. And then later in life, she moved on to magic and burlesque and became a very prolific individual in show business. The other person I interviewed um, that also performed as a geek, completely different story altogether. This person, very fond of the sideshow, but never worked in a sideshow. Rather, this person is more of an urban artist type. And back in his early years, he would perform the geek act as a means of performance art. He would do it in art galleries and film festivals. And his perspective was that the geek was sort of symbolic. It was a debasement of humanity, where you're lowering yourself so low that you've effectively freed yourself from the constraints we have as a civilized human. So for him, it wasn't necessarily about the money, and it wasn't necessarily about running traditional sideshow. It was about creating this cutting edge, pushing the boundaries performance art. And so he bit the heads off of chickens and mice for all these underground events, actually here in New York City, in New York. So that was his story. All right, now we get into some allied acts. A common act that you saw, see associated with, with the geek is the wild man act. Pretty self-explanatory, uh, wild men, or sometimes wild women as well. They were basically performers that were just gussied up to look all crazy and uh, feral and oftentimes put in cages and people would pay money to see them. That was the act. <laughs> Oftentimes, these weren't the most politically correct. Unfortunately, those were different times. But uh, oftentimes, geeks were given wild people backstories, but not always. So wild men could be geeks, and geeks could be wild men. But they were not necessarily synonymous. Um, the main factor that separates them would be if they worked with animals or not. Oftentimes, wild men would have raw meat in there that they would eat or throw at people, but they didn't work with live animals. That was really reserved for the geeks. Intriguingly, one of my appendices, I had an interview with someone that did a, a geek act, and what he did is in the very forgiving kind of southern states, he would do his geek act, and then in some of the areas where there was more tighter law enforcement, he would do the wild man act. So he had two different costumes for the same act, but one of them, he, he wouldn't bite the heads off of animals. He would just get chained to a post and act crazy. So I, I believe in the previous lecture, we were talking about family show versus adult show. That's kind of a, almost a primitive, kind of sort of similar scenario. You know, two, two versions of the same act, depending on your region. So that was, uh, that was how that kind of functioned. Now, another allied act were the human ostriches. Does anybody here want to take a guess what a human ostrich is? Anybody? You. Yo, you again. <laughs> oh, how would you know? It's not like you've read the book. It's not like I was reading on the way here or anything. <laughs> uh, they, would be, they would eat sort of like ordinary household, so like glass eaters. Exactly. So the idea behind the human ostrich is uh, an ostrich, as it said, will try to eat anything. So human ostriches were basically entertainers that would make money by eating seemingly non-edible items. That was their, their act. They would eat things like glass, pocket knives, watches, chains, tacks, nails, and, and so forth. Much like the geek, uh, this generally falls into a two-classification system. The first one is the digestive human ostriches, that they would literally just eat these things completely ungimmicked and let uh, nature take its course and defecate out those objects at a, at a later date. But Obviously, a lot of these things are not good on the digestive system. So a lot of these digestive ostriches wound up in the hospital, and a lot of them literally died doing this act. What? And quit showbiz? <laughs> so those were the uh, digestive uh, human ostriches. These other ones were the uh, 
regurgitative hot human ostriches. Now, regurgitative human ostriches, similar thing, but they could actually have the muscular control internally to regurgitate these objects up at will. It was a skill that they developed, and so naturally it was a lot safer for them, and it was also um, a lot more interesting to the audience being able to do that. So you saw human ostriches tended to get, uh, the digestive ones were popular, kind of predating the geek by a little bit in the dime museums of the 1880s, whereas the regurgitative ones were a little higher billing. You tended to see them sometimes in vaudeville stages, uh, people like Mac Norton, Haji Ali. They actually did pretty well for themselves as uh, doing various regurgitation acts. Kind of another bleed over you see is uh, geek magic. That was something that kind of intrigued me when I was writing this book because what geek magic is, is, is basically you're doing a gross or shocking, oftentimes self-inflicted feat, but it's done through the act of illusion. So the method is illusion. So you're basically taking this idea, this feeling, this trope of geek, this disgusting, this shock, and moving it over into a subgenre of magic and saying that we can achieve this feeling, but do so through the act of illusion. So it's still the shock and disgust, and that kind of became what's known as geek magic. Beyond that, if you look through magic history, you also see a lot of instances of people doing things like decapitating animals. There's an act that was popular with performers like Bartomelio Bosco, uh, Surveil LeRoy, and even David Copperfield, where you take two birds of different colors, you decapitate them, you switch the heads, and now the bird, say like the white bird now has the black head, and the black bird has the white head. So that's kind of interesting, having that shock factor that involves actually decapitating these, these animals. Intriguingly, if you look through uh, magic history, one of the, what is arguably the very first written record of magic, it's on the West Car Papyrus in Egypt, actually discusses a magician named Didi, who went before the king and decapitated several animals before him. Very shocking spectacle. And then he was able to restore the heads to these animals. Now there's debate as for if Didi was a real person or not. Probably wasn't. But it's interesting that that motif, that feeling, kind of resonated so much even with uh, ancient Egyptian history. Now we're going to touch upon a little bit of a brief history of the Geeked Act itself. Naturally, uh, eating and doing gross things, you can't really trace that back. I'm sure there were cavemen, Neanderthals, grossing out each other by eating whatever the hell they could get their hands on. Huh? I mean, that's untraceable. But you really started seeing geeks kind of start to pop up into organized show business in the outdoor entertainment industry in the early 1900s, between 1898 and 1900 you saw an outburst of snake eaters. They were called snake eaters during that time because the word geek, as it applied to the act, was not, not yet established. So what snake eaters were was they would eat snakes at fairs and outdoor festivals. A common trope was for them to have like a strange name and then just the snake eater. There was Bosco the snake eater, Isu the snake eater, Rasco the snake eater. And these became so common that there was even an issue of the billboard, the outdoor amusement uh, magazine, that had talked about the 1900 season. And they actually said this. They said, if there is a single outdoor festival this year that does not have a snake eater, then we consider that fair a true wonder. Because that's how common and popular snake eating was. It, during this time period, it's very strange, but it was, it was a very popular thing. You also saw in the uh, late teens and early 20s kind of the evolution of people using the term geek. That's kind of when that term started. Quite a while after people started eating snakes for, uh, for a popular use in the outdoor entertainment industry, it's a little unclear about where the term geek itself actually originated as it relates to the Sideshow Act. Geek itself is a word of a Germanic origin. It comes from the word gecken. It just means fool or simpleton. 
So you can kind of see how that would be applied to that particular act, you know, a very seemingly unskilled person that does these debasing acts for money, shocking and gross, fool, simpleton, kind of makes sense. You started hearing murmurs of people using the term geek in various issues of classifieds of magazines like the Billboard as well as just general newspaper articles. They would say things like, geek man wanted must be comfortable with snakes, or geek show hiring workers will supply outfit. <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing. So you started seeing this, this kind of people talking more and more about this, different murmurs, and so it was likely just an insider word that developed within the uh, showman industry. And then you had things like the act becoming more organized. You started seeing it more with a pit and people taking on characters, the wild person, and then you saw people moving away from snakes and moving into the, the common trope we have now of chickens, people biting the head off a chicken. Why chickens? Well, much like uh, digestive human ostriches, a lot of people were seriously injured or killed working with snakes. There were people that were amputees from getting bit during their act and they had to lob off limbs if they were venomous snakes. Some of them died. There was even a few stories of people biting the heads off of snakes and the snake bites their <coughs> mouth tissue midway through the act and then they just swell shut and they can't breathe. Yeah, this is pretty hardcore. But, uh, and so with, with chickens, you didn't have that. And also chickens are a lot more accessible. You go to a lot of their southern states, it's very easy to get your hands on chickens as, as opposed to uh, exotic snakes. Some people are of the belief that uh, William Lizzie Grisham came up with the term geek when he released the book Nightmare Alley in 1946. Not, not accurate, but he did help propel the term geek into the mainstream culture. And by that, I mean, when he released that book, geek shows were still relatively common. They were still, still a, very much a thing. But you didn't really hear the word geek too much outside of the trade publications. And maybe if you frequented the, uh, you know, the midways, you might have picked up some of that. But uh, when he released Nightmare Alley, like I said, not only was the geek act still happening, but there's a character in the book that is a geek. And in the book, he both explains what a geek is, and he uses the geek as sort of an allegory for the personal success and failure of man in that book. So it really helped kind of take that word and say, this is what it means in Sideshow and expose it to a regular audience. And then of course, the following year it was adapted into a film and then, you know, it was adapted to a film again uh, a few years later. So Nightmare Alley really helped kind of propel it in terms of like the language about what a geek is in terms of mainstream culture. But about that time, shortly after, you kind of saw the Geek Act falling out of favor. Now the Geek Act was always controversial. I mean, there's always stories about their acts getting shut down and that sort of thing. But by the 50s in particular, it became even more or less common. Um, obvious reasons for this. I mean, television's more common in households, so people had moved the type of entertainment they were digesting, changing sensibilities as it relates to animal rights, human rights, just the evolution of culture, essentially. And then something kind of comical happened in the 1970s. You saw what could be almost seen as a collective rebranding of the sideshow geek. And that was, let's get away from this image of this crazy feral wild person and let's try to do a social good. So what they did is they came up with what was known as the horrors of drug abuse. And so what this show was is you would go into the attraction and instead of seeing a pit with a wild person in it, you would see what was typically a young man, oftentimes sitting in a wheelchair, and he would just be sitting there catatonic or acting strange with a snake around his neck or on his lap, just, oh. Now he wouldn't kill the snake, but he would often, you know, pretend to put it in his mouth or he'd, you know, flick it at people, just doing bizarre stuff with snakes. And then behind him, there would be a sign and the sign would say something like, this is young Billy. He was depressed. So he took a bunch of LSD 
and it destroyed his life. <laughs> now he thinks his best friend is a snake. Don't be like Billy. Don't do drugs. Was this rebranding effective? Uh, if you go by newspaper reports, not exactly, but it did buy some time and a little bit of more mileage for the Geek Act for a lot of showmen with this uh, new uh, branding of what a sideshow geek attraction uh, could be. That was the horrors of drug abuse. You saw the Geek Act kind of dwindle quite a bit after that. Um, then obviously, sideshow in general kind of dwindled as well. But by the time there was the revival in the 90s with uh, moving the sideshow away from the carnival lot and more into things like rock clubs and tattoo conventions, a lot of the acts persevered, the sword swallowers, the fire eaters. But you didn't really see the geek act. Sure, we do have, again, a modern interpretation. Moving on from the horrors of drug abuse, we have, obviously, the insectivore act now. That's kind of geek. It doesn't use vertebrae animals, and it's quite a departure from the old-timey pit shows, but I think there's an argument to be made that that could be called a geek. I mean, language changes, so that is a version of modern geek, if you will. You also saw in the 90s and 2000s, some interesting things happen in that you started to see the geek term get used in different connotations. We didn't so much have the geek act anymore, but even going back further than that, you started to see smatterings of people using the term geek to describe like a general outsider or even a technologically obsessed individual. This goes back at various odd points, various odd references in literature. Perhaps, again, going back to the, the Germanic word fool or simpleton. But interestingly enough, you started to see the word geek move away from sideshow entirely in the 70s and 80s and being used more to describe, like I said, almost like an insult. Like, oh, just there's some geeks over there, you know, like schoolyard slang in a sense. Intriguingly, one of the main things, or one reason rather, that this happened actually relates to an anecdote with uh, pro wrestling. Professional wrestling has, has a lot of roots similar to Sideshow, going back to various fairground lots. And oftentimes there was a lot of bleed over subculturally as well as with the lingo and vernacular. And so you see a lot of Sideshow performers that they speak carny, but often a lot of times old timey wrestlers did as well, and that's how they would call their matches in the ring discreetly. But there was a wrestler in particular by the name of Classy Freddie Blassie. Any Blassie fans in the house? Yeah. Oh, got a Blassie man back there. <laughs> so here's an interesting anecdote. This, this is just so incredible. Classy Freddie Blassie used to work the fairgrounds back in his younger days. And he was always known in wrestling as a heel or a bad guy. He had the bravado. He liked to provoke people. It was a lot grittier and real back then before it was rebranded as sports entertainment in the late 90s. Anyways, Blassie, what he would do is he'd, you know, wrestle at these carnival lots. And one time he was doing a lot and somebody said to him, hey, Blassie, there's a geek tent over there. You should go see the geek tent after your match. So Blassie went over and he saw the, went to the geek show and he saw an emaciated geek biting the heads off of animals and sticking nails in his hand and doing all this crazy stuff. And afterwards, Blassie's friend said, Blassie, what'd you think of the geek show? Blassie, with his classic bravado, said, huh, you see that geek back there? He had a neck like a stack of dimes. He'd what you call a pencil neck geek. And so Bla that term was so comical that Blassie started using this term to insult other wrestlers as well as his fans. He had this phrase where he would get in front of a camera and say, listen up, you pencil neck geeks. And that was kind of his shtick, and he, he ran with that for the rest of his career. But the interesting thing to think about is if you listen to that through the context of now, you think, oh, he's the big brass jock condescending to these weak nerd people. But in actuality, what he was actually doing at the time was equating the lesser people to the lowest of the low on the sideshow lot, the sideshow geek. So that's, and he, oh, another funny thing. He actually released in the 1980s a song called Listen, You Pencil Neck Geek, where he plays acoustic guitar and rants about how much he hates geeks. It's on YouTube and it's hilarious. Check it out. 
hysterical. <laughs> but in, in any event, you started seeing this shift. You know, the geek shows were not common anymore, and you started to see like the school year talk of people using the term geek to insult people. Now, this continued up until, you know, maybe 90s-ish or so. And then you saw another interesting thing happen. We see this a lot now with a lot of language that was originally meant as derogatory. And that is people started using the term geek and kind of taking it back, taking ownership of it, and using it as a form of, like, pride almost. It's not necessarily an insult. We started using it almost in the context of it's similar to a nerd, but they're not synonymous. Geeks, rather... There are more just people that are passionate about something that's part of a greater subculture. We have comic book geeks, anime geeks, video game geeks, you know, sports geeks. When we get excited about something, we geek out over it. And so the term geek started to kind of become this thing of like, okay, it's not sideshow and it's not an insult. It's just something that makes us happy, that we are excited about, that's a part of a greater picture of a subculture. And you also saw that kind of change even further on a corporate level when in the 90s, there was a company named Geek Squad. <laughs> and geeks went fully corporate. And so if you need your computer fixed, find somebody who's an expert at that particular niche, computers. And so that kind of brings us full circle as it relates to the sideshow geek, the fool, the simpleton, that moved into this, the lower than low on sideshow, and that went extinct, so it became an insult. Now it became a sense of pride. Now you look, you Google the word geek, you're not gonna get hardly anything about sideshow unless you typically type, unless you type in sideshow or chicken eating specifically. You're gonna get hits for various things relating to pop culture. And that's just part of the way language and culture works. You know, times change. And that's why I like to implore people that regardless of how things change and regardless of where things go, we're all show people. So please do not forget about the Sideshow Geek and the unique niche that it har carved into Sideshow history. Thank you. All right. And with that, I've got about 10, 15 minutes for a Q&A. If anybody has any specific questions, I'm happy to address those. Yes, over there. Hey, you named a bunch of stuff, but do you uh, have an opinion as to why the act is finished in time? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, per perfect storm. I mean, obviously, similar to vaudeville, you saw, like, the talkies and televisions and households getting rid of that. But, I mean, just uh, actually an interesting thing here is just, it's mostly cultural, in my opinion. You know, back... You go back far enough, people would literally go to, like, coliseums to watch people hack each other apart. That was commonplace. So then, you know, centuries later, seeing people eating live animals, commonplace. And then as we kind of just change as a society, particularly in, you know, different st countries, uh, North America and whatnot, you know, we, we see that more, more and more kind of fall out of favor. And so you see things like, I actually write in this book, too, about there's a chapter on competitive goldfish eating which was actually pretty popular in the 30s all the way through the 70s. But now they have things now where it's like if you eat a goldfish in some areas, people will be very upset with you. There's even some, some modern uh, notes I have in here about somebody that did a geek act just in the news, and they had the book thrown at them because people were so outraged, whereas had they done that 50 years earlier, they might have had a job. But uh, so a lot of it's just changing culture. You know, we get... Just, it's just the way people, people work. We get more sensibilities and ethics, and those kind of become assimilated over time into our cultural, cultural mass based on our geography. It's just kind of the nature of evolution. Yes? Competitive eating is like a geek act. Yeah, I can see, I can see that argument. I mean, it, there's no live animals, but you're, in a lot of ways, you're kind of doing something shocking, right? And oftentimes they have like this stuff going on in their mouths and that. Yeah, so in a way, you could say that there is some geek spirit with uh, competitive eating. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes? <laughs> I told my publisher that I would do it one time at a show to promote the book if he wanted to, and he said, no. I said I would do it. I would never work at Cody again if I don't. Maybe I would. I saw the show last night. You guys got away with quite a bit. I don't know. 
<laughs> sideshow, oh, oof, oof. Who said sideshow cat? Who would, who would geek sideshow cat? Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I, I, I had a chapter in here, too, about, like, over in Japan. Well, first of all, there was an interesting geek performer in Japan I talk about, but uh, there is a form of sushi in Japan where you literally eat the animal. It's, it's cut, but it's still living. And so for them in that area, that's fine. Or an old boy that actually ate alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a thing that they do in certain areas of, of Japan still. That's, you know, that's culture, and that's fine over there. So it, it just depends on, you know, where that particular area is and where we are and how we feel as a collective, which is acceptable and what isn't. So it's just kind of interesting like that. Um, you said that they switched from snakes for health reasons, but like in terms of just eating live chickens or pigs, was there still, I mean, something else? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's funny, oh my gosh. So the one guy I interviewed, the first one I talked about, the, the lifelong career guy, <laughs> I asked him about what his opinion was with working with a different animals and he was so analytical about it. He's like, well, you know, when you eat the, the pigs or the chicken, you know, you can still get salmonella and they're kind of gross, but the pig, you can wash it so it's a little cleaner. But, you know, the snake, you know, you bite the head off and the damn thing can't do anything to you. But the, the pig's going to run around and the chicken's going to peck at you. And he had like this whole like pro-con of the different animals. It's like, wow, that's, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's different strokes for different folks and pro cons depending on uh, what animals you choose to work with, I suppose. Yes. Are you gonna have another book coming out? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, yes, I am working on another book. Uh, this book, it's gonna be similar to the Geek Book in the sense that it's gonna deal with another extreme sideshow feat uh, in terms of the uh, history behind it. But I'm also researching to write the book around my quest to uncover the showbiz misery, mystery of a very prolific performer that did this particular act, and he, was, he got most of his popularity right here in Coney Island from 1928 to 1931. So I'm trying, but he came here, did this amazing act for a few seasons, and then he left, went back to Europe, and he just never seen again, and nobody knows who he was. So I'm trying to find out if I can solve the mystery about who he was while creating a narrative around the history of the genre that he uh, performed in. So that's, if all goes well, that'll be my next book. Give me a couple years. <laughs> yes? What advice, if any, would you give to a modern geek performer? Modern geek, could you clarify? Are you doing insectivore or what's your... Uh... Sure. Like, specifically, yes, I am. But if you wanted to branch out into other subcategories or... The imagery of it all, like, sure. would you paint yourself? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Another thing I should mention, too, is we talk about, like, the evolution of language. The term geek, too, you even see that in some science show circles now, just to mean any performer in science show that does anything gross or shocking. You know, that, that's common, you know. And I, I think a lot of that, too, becomes a just snappy headlines. Freaks and geeks. Yeah, okay. So oftentimes you see a lot of sideshow entertainers who just say, I'm a geek because I do shocking gross things. Sure, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, regarding your question, I, you know, it's, I would look at it through the lens of uh, you would any act. I mean, try to have a presentation that makes sense. I interviewed uh, Reggie Boumouche. You guys know Reggie? Yeah. yeah, she had some interesting things. She talked about how early on in her act when she used to do the insectivore act, she would come out and pretend she was on a date with someone in the audience. She would she'd be all dressed up all formally and they'd bring out the food and there'd be like worms and crickets and she'd just be eating those in front of this person like she was on a classy date, you know, dressed up very nice, but eating all these gross things. So that was kind of her, her perspective is have like that interesting clash. So I think, you know, the same thing applies. You know, try to come up with an interesting presentation of it. You know, if you just come out and start eating bugs, that's cool, but really sell it by coming up with something that makes it unique to you. And I, I think that the showbiz adage applies, presentation is everything, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Next evolution, like people just biting circuit boards and that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, we can only hope. I mean, I feel that way. <laughs> there are times you don't. I don't need to hire a geek to like want to do that to my computer. Holy moly! I think we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. See, human ostrich geek. Human ostrich geek. Human ostrich geek. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Uh, do you have any more questions, anybody? Okay, well, I will say I do have uh, books for sale. We're doing a discount today at $20 for the book. I'll also throw in a sticker. Happy to sign it in ink or in blood if you want to. These are $5 if you like, so it's up to you. But in any event, I really appreciate you coming to my lecture at Talking Geek. Thank you so much, Coney. Thank you. My man.